Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're taking a closer look at what's happening in the world of industrial. This is a summary of the findings from several new industry reports on the topic. The growth in e-commerce is fueling demand for more industrial and more warehouse space across the nation. The rise in groundbreakings translated to the delivery of 310 million square feet of new industrial space over the past four quarters ended in March of 21. The most activity was across the Sun Belt and the Midwest, including Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, Chicago. Those three accounted for nearly half the space delivered nationally. The exponential growth of e-commerce during the pandemic and recent migration trends have supported a restocking of the pipeline. And as of May, 436 million square feet of new construction was underway with another 160 million square feet of industrial space that's proposed in the pipeline. Currently, vacancy is falling in industrial despite the new supply additions. Vacancy fell 10 basis points to a national average of 5.4%. That means some markets are slightly oversupplied and others are undersupplied. The supply chain disruptions experienced in the past year across a wide range of commodities and products have caused many businesses to rethink the just-in-time delivery model that's permeated virtually every supply chain globally. Minimizing inventory in the channel has been the name of the game, but in a case of careful what you wish for, many industries have indeed minimized their inventories down to zero, and the number of products that I've tried to order in the construction industry that are out of stock is astounding. Lead times are elevated across the board. Businesses have realized that money's cheap and you can fund a responsible amount of inventory pretty inexpensively. The cost of inventory is directly related to the cost of money, and with interest rates at all-time lows, minimizing inventory is less important than security supply. That means building resilience into the supply chain. That means building alternate sources of supply for products that don't need to be sole-sourced. If sole-sourcing a product is the only option, well, then creating a buffer in the system is important. And shipping products quickly to customers who want them the next day either means high shipping costs or warehousing it close to the point of consumption. The major transportation hubs have already attracted a lot of investment in the industrial space, just like we've seen in Houston and Dallas. The opportunity lies in three main areas, in my opinion. Number one, there's opportunity in secondary and tertiary markets that have been largely overlooked. Number two, there's an opportunity in specialty space, such as refrigerated warehouse space. This gives perishable products in the supply chain more flexibility to optimize their business operations in less expensive space than retail space. And number three, sale leasebacks for both manufacturing and logistics for medium-sized manufacturers. Now, many states have secondary markets that have indeed achieved critical mass. Now, Seattle, for example, is a primary market. It's got a strong industrial base and a strong logistics presence. But what about Spokane, the second largest city in the state? Miami clearly has a large industrial base and a strong transportation hub, but what about Fort Myers? Atlanta has a massive industrial base, but what about Savannah? Denver's got plenty, but what about Colorado Springs or Fort Collins or Grand Junction? You get the idea. So let's look at refrigerated space. If the supermarket model is going to be disrupted, well, now is the time. The U.S. online grocery market finished March of this year with $9.3 billion in sales as over 69 million households in the U.S. placed an average of 2.8 orders online during the month. That's according to Brick Meets Click. They conducted a survey in the last week of March of this year. Sales jumped 43% versus a year ago, where sales were only $6.5 billion, and it quantifies the disruptive impact of the pandemic, and it continues to alter the way people get their groceries. So if the grocery model is going to be disrupted, the question is how? If you've ever walked into a Costco business center warehouse, you'll find a single refrigerated room that carries everything perishable. We're talking meats, eggs, cheese, vegetable, fruits, all in one giant room. The non-perishable products are elsewhere in the warehouse. See, building a single refrigerator that's, say, 50,000 square feet or larger is a specialized activity, but it's actually cheaper than building a building, heating the building, and then filling the building with dozens of refrigerators. That was the old way of doing things. The energy inefficiency and the capital cost of that outdated way of refrigerating is staggering compared with building a single large refrigerated space. But this kind of space is not only needed near the point of consumption, it's also required near the point of production. Think about places like the Central Valley in California, which produces so much of the fresh food 
that makes its way to our table. And then finally, we've got businesses that are coming out of the pandemic looking for new ways to deploy their capital. Owning a building is not necessarily key to being in business. Several businesses are recapitalizing by selling physical assets and then leasing them back. But if you're going to play in that segment of the market, you need to become an expert at evaluating the health of those businesses. The credit worthiness of your seller and now your new tenant is of paramount importance as you conduct your due diligence. So that's what's new, in my view, in the world of industrial. And as you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. I'll talk to you again tomorrow.